tonight the urgent terror threat to U.S. forces in Afghanistan. The president has warned another attack in Kabul is likely the next few days the most dangerous. The death toll from yesterday's suicide bombing staggering. Those 13 U.S. service members who made the ultimate sacrifice. What we're learning about them tonight and the 170 Afghans killed. Evacuation flights resuming. The president vowing to continue the mission as he faces growing criticism. The serious threat from Hurricane Ida taking aim at the Gulf Coast. Now on high alert for what could be a powerful Category 4 storm. Al Roker has the track and the timing. Disturbing news on the COVID surge. Cases among children on the rise as schools reopen. Plus, a Florida judge dealing a blow to the governor's ban on mask mandates and the growing demand for a promising COVID treatment. The Supreme Court ruling that could now put millions of Americans at risk of eviction. The stunning decision, Sirhan Sirhan, the man convicted for assassinating Robert F. Kennedy, recommended for parole. But will he be released? An inspiring America, the Afghan-American pilot, and the refugees he's helping right now. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, sworn enemies with a bitter 20-year legacy written in blood. Tonight, the United States and the Taliban facing a mutual threat. Anxiety high in Kabul amid what U.S. intelligence believes is a specific and credible threat. ISIS terrorists will strike again on the heels of yesterday's bombing attack outside the international airport that killed at least 13 U.S. troops and left well over 100 Afghans dead. Tonight, the American pullout from Afghanistan at a critical stage. The long war coming to a tortured, heartbreaking and uncertain end. Richard Engel leads our coverage tonight. These are the United States security partners in Kabul. The Taliban protecting American forces at the airport their way, keeping Afghans from reaching the airport gate, extending the security perimeter. While hundreds of Americans have been evacuated in the last 24 hours, if you're an Afghan trying to get to the airport now, the path is blocked. The U.S. military says it's coordinating security with the Taliban closely. It's more needed now than ever after yesterday's suicide bombing killed at least 13 American service members, most of them Marines, while they were doing pat-downs of evacuees. Among them, Navy Corpsman Maxton Soviak from Ohio, whose sister describes her baby brother as beautiful, intelligent, beats to the sound of his own drum. 20-year-old Marine David Lee Espinosa, born in Texas, the mayor of his hometown today calling him a fallen hero. Marine Riley McCollum, a former high school wrestler from Wyoming, expecting a baby in just a few weeks. Lance Corporal Kareem Nikui and Corporal Hunter Lopez, both from Southern California. And Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz, a Marine from Missouri. More than 150 Afghans were killed. At Kabul's main hospital today, the butcher's bill of some of the dead and nearly 200 injured was posted outside. Coffins arrived in a steady stream. Mohammed Safar was wounded in the blast. An asylum seeker, Mohammed says he was standing by the airport gate playing a game on his phone when suddenly the bomb knocked him unconscious. ISIS-K, an enemy of both the U.S. and the Taliban, claimed responsibility. U.S. intelligence warns they'll try more attacks as the U.S. winds up its evacuation by Tuesday. We were at Kabul airport yesterday, just hours before the blast, filming Afghans who, now that the gates are effectively shut, were among the last to make it in. Fatima Haridi played forward on a local soccer team, league champions in the city of Herat. She got out with her coach and several relatives. Why are you leaving now? Because uh, of uh, coming to Taliban, we couldn't play football anymore, and uh, they didn't allow us, I know, I'm sure. And we, should, we had to leave this country because of that. Down the line was Halilzad, daughter Mehan, nine months, and wife Sina. Halilzad's brother was an Air Force pilot who fought with the U.S. against the Taliban. The thing that we want is a safe life, better life, and better future for our children. That's important for us. Yeah. And we are, I think we are now heading to Italy. Italy? Yeah. Okay. Well, bon viaggio. Ciao. Gracias. Ciao. We saw foreign troops pax on, boarding planes with the Afghans. A sign the end is near. Foreign forces brought in to protect the evacuation, now evacuating themselves. 
Richard, for Afghans who want to get out, how will they do that once the Americans leave? They're going to have to wait until the civilian airport opens, and that should open after the evacuation is complete. And the Taliban again today said that people who have visas will be free to leave the country. All right, Richard Engel, thank you. Let's drill down on, on that urgent new warning President Biden was given today that another terror attack is likely. It came as he defended his withdrawal strategy amid withering criticism. Peter Alexander is at the White House. Tonight, just 24 hours after the deadliest assault on American troops in more than a decade, President Biden's national security team today giving him the dire warning. Another terror attack in Kabul is likely, but saying they're taking steps to protect U.S. troops there. The president was told the next few days of this mission will be the most dangerous period to date. Today, meeting with the Israeli prime minister, President Biden again mourning the lives lost, but standing by his operation. The mission there being performed is dangerous, and it's, uh, now it's come with a significant loss of American personnel. And, uh, but it's a worthy mission. Now, after Thursday's deadly attack, the administration's execution of that mission, already under withering criticism, is sparking new backlash, including over its reliance on the Taliban to provide security for U.S. troops at the airport. If we're trusting them to screen people get to the airport, how did that suicide bomber get through the Taliban screening point? We need to hold the Taliban accountable for it as well. Marine Kareem Nakui was among those killed in the Kabul attack. His father today slamming the president and his administration for not protecting his son, telling the Daily Beast they had the Taliban outside providing security. I blame my own military leaders. Biden turned his back on him. Meanwhile, the White House will not say whether the U.S. will send troops back into Afghanistan after the 31st to target the ISIS terror group they blame for the attack, but say the president's commitment to find those who carried it out has not changed. I think he made clear yesterday that he does not want them to live on the earth anymore. And Peter, while they're hunting for ISIS fighters, the Pentagon also revealing how many ISIS prisoners were recently freed by the Taliban. Yeah, Lester, that's right. The Pentagon for the first time says thousands of ISIS prisoners were released from prisons, including at Bagram Air Base, after the U.S. handed it over to the Afghan security forces. But when the Taliban took over, they set those prisoners free. Lester? Peter, thank you. Back home, let's turn to Hurricane Ida, now forecast to hit the Gulf Coast this weekend as a potentially life-threatening Category 4 storm. Al Roker is following its track for us. Al, what's the latest? Lester, Ida right now, a Category 1 storm, 675 miles southeast of New Orleans, 80 mile per hour winds, and it's moving at a fairly good cliff northwest at 15. What we're most concerned about, the current Gulf waters are in their upper 80s. That's 3 to 5 degrees above average, and that is going to lead to rapid intensification. We look forward to Sunday afternoon sometime, this making landfall somewhere along the Louisiana coast as a Category 4 storm, and it could be higher. Anywhere from Lake Charles, New Orleans, Mobile, Panama City, all going to be feeling its effects. We have storm surge forecast of 10 to 15 feet in central Louisiana coastline. We're looking for wind gusts of up to 75 miles per hour and rainfall amounts, isolated amounts. Lester could get up to 20 inches of rain. I'm heading down to New Orleans. We're going to be covering this all weekend long. This Lester. could be an ugly one. Stay safe, Al. Thank you. In a state of emergency already in effect tonight in Louisiana, where people are bracing for Ida, the devastation of Katrina and other powerful storms still seared in their memories. Morgan Chesky is there tonight. Tonight in Louisiana, a summer-long sigh of relief is over. Hurricane Ida putting New Orleans on high alert, supplies disappearing in an all-too-familiar rush. We all know from Katrina, you know that something like this is not to be uh, played with. Ida's potential path covering nearly the entire coastline of Louisiana. They see all the conditions necessary uh, for it to strengthen very, very rapidly. Governor John Bell Edwards declaring a state of emergency and with hospitals already packed with COVID patients, urging everyone to get vaccinated. The prospect of sheltering potentially thousands and thousands of people at the height of the fourth surge is very daunting. To the Western Lake Charles, daunting deja vu. We don't need another storm. Crystal Fogelman lost her home exactly one year ago to Laura. Now, even a glancing blow from Ida could be disaster for the trailer. 
her family calls home. And if it happens again, which I hope to God it does not, we'll, we'll definitely move out of the hur hurricane zone. <laughs> That's that. <laughs> That's that. It's stressful. It's tiring. Um, it takes everything out of you. It really does. And tonight, officials have already issued voluntary and mandatory evacuations for those in low-lying areas, but others tell me they're not taking any chances, remembering all too well the three hurricanes that made landfall here just last year. Lester. Morgan Chesky, thank you. In just 60 seconds, the battle over mask mandates and a major ruling in the state hardest hit by the Delta variant. U.S. intelligence officials remain sharply divided tonight over the origins of COVID. According to a new report, one intel agency believes the virus most likely came from a lab accident in Wuhan, China. But four others suggest it may have begun naturally. All agencies agree China is hindering the global investigation. They want to turn out of COVID in the classroom and a major ruling over masks in schools for hard-hit Florida. It all comes as many hospitals nationwide are at a breaking point. Miguel Almaguer reports. With our nation deeply divided over how to best protect children in school, today a Florida judge ruling the governor's controversial ban on mask mandates in the classroom is unlawful. A major defeat with similar legal challenges already underway in states like Texas and Arizona, who are also defying CDC guidance. I'm personally uh, sick and tired of people playing politics with my child's life. As more children become infected with COVID, the CDC warns hospitalizations will rise. A growing number of pediatric units are already overwhelmed. Without proper you know, barriers in, in, in place like masks, social distancing, so we expect to see that these numbers are going to probably keep going up. Delta is still driving infections around the world. A new study from the UK says the variant is doubling the risk of hospitalization. States like Alabama already at a breaking point. We are really in a crisis situation. I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to, uh, to do this. As the pandemic grows more dire and more hospitals are in need of a lifeline, the U.S. has again surpassed 2,000 deaths in a single day. Breaking the grim benchmark for the first time since March, a new model now suggests by December 1st, 107,000 more could still die. That was horrific. You gotta let your child die. Lisa Brandon lost her two sons, Aaron and Free, within 12 hours of each other. She was vaccinated. They were not. This is the, the most devastating thing I've ever, ever been through. Tonight, one mother's preventable loss as our nation sees far too much heartbreak every day. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. Meantime, across several states, people are lining up for promising antibody treatments like the one former President Trump was given. Here's Gabe Gutierrez with more. In Tampa, the line for monoclonal antibody treatment stretches across the fairgrounds, even before the center opens. I haven't been feeling too well the last couple of days and just, you know, taking a precautionary measure. With hospitals packed with COVID patients, the state of Florida is opening 21 pop-up sites like this. Monoclonal antibodies are made in a lab and bind to viruses, stopping them from infecting more cells. The results have been really, um, really positive and we want to keep up the momentum. Dr. Anthony Fauci says the underutilized treatments can reduce the risk of hospitalization and death by up to 85 percent. It is important to emphasize that this must be done early in infection and not wait, of course, until a person is sick enough to be hospitalized. The effort is now ramping up in other states, including Texas, Missouri, and Iowa, where the antibodies are being given in nursing homes. It does lower the viral load for those individuals that have the infection. But the treatments had usually been administered through IVs. The one at these sites in Florida are injected through four shots, one in each arm and two in the stomach. They're meant for people who've already tested positive for COVID, and patients must wait an hour to observe any adverse reactions. The ones we spoke with had not been vaccinated, and yet were eager to get this treatment. Um, 
I feel very tired. Natalie Santiago tested positive days ago after her husband got sick. What's the difference in your mind between getting this treatment versus getting the vaccine? Well, I think now that I'm sick, I just want to get better, so I'm willing to do what I need to do to do that. The FDA has authorized these treatments for emergency use in adults and children over the age of 12, but public health experts stress they are not a substitute for getting vaccinated. Lester? All right. Gabe Gutierrez with that. Thank you. Millions of Americans at risk for eviction are on edge tonight after a Supreme Court decision ended pandemic protections. Morgan Radford now on the impact for renters and landlords. Demia Burse could soon have nowhere to go. We'll be staying at the park if we can't get any assistance. We first spoke to her during the pandemic when the CDC moratorium was extended. It's stressful. It's hard. She is one of more than 8 million Americans who are behind on their rent. Overnight, the Supreme Court blocked an eviction moratorium issued by the Centers for Disease Control, meant to protect renters like her until early October. My heart dropped. It was like, wow, on top of everything that's going on, this added more pressure. In a 6-3 to three opinion, the court said the CDC does not have the authority to keep the moratorium going. A reversal the White House calls disappointing. What we're trying to do here is prevent people from being evicted from their homes. But a group of realtors argued before the Supreme Court that landlords have lost as much as $19 billion a month since the moratorium began. I will be going down to the courts on Monday and I will be actually submitting eviction paperwork on every single tenant that owes me money to date. Deb Pusateri owns 70 buildings in Albany, New York, and says the Supreme Court decision is past due. Where do we get the money to keep paying the bills? Where do we get the money to keep supporting the tenants? Who's going to pay back the debt that I've incurred? Meanwhile, states are currently working to distribute the first half of the $46 billion of emergency funds that have been approved by Congress. But the Treasury Department announced Wednesday that only 20 percent of that money has actually made it to renters, leaving renters like Burse racing against the clock. For the moratorium to be reinstated, the Supreme Court says Congress would need to vote to extend it. Meanwhile, experts say landlords could begin the eviction process as early as next week. Lester. All right, Morgan, thank you. Coming up for us, breaking news on the man who killed Robert F. Kennedy, Sirhan Sirhan. Could he go free? We're back with breaking developments about the man who killed Robert F. Kennedy. Sirhan Sirhan was recommended for parole late today after more than five decades in prison. Our Stephanie Gosk has late details. I'll go and let's win there. 53 years ago, moments after Robert F. Kennedy won the California primary, Sirhan Sirhan fatally shot him in L.A.'s Ambassador Hotel. My son of the county has been shot. Today, in a stunning decision, the parole board recommended the gunman be released from prison, something few had predicted. How surprised would you be if the parole board lets Sirhan Sirhan out on parole? I would be astonished. The parole hearing, Sirhan's 16th, drew scrutiny because for the first time ever, no prosecutor from L.A. County attended. D.A. George Gascon's office saying in a statement, the role of a prosecutor ends at sentencing, adding if someone is the same person that committed an atrocious crime, that person will correctly not be found suitable for release. On the one hand, it's surprising because Sirhan Sirhan is such a notorious criminal. But on the other hand, there has been a trend away from locking up criminals and throwing away the key. That other As the recently elected Gascon told Lester in May, he hopes to be transformative in his new role. My priorities are really how do we reimagine the way that we bring security and safety and public health to our community. Critics worried the prosecutor's absence from Sirhan's parole hearing could open the door to letting a dangerous criminal who changed the course of U.S. history back on the streets. Sirhan is not out yet. There will be a 90-day review before the decision lands on the governor's desk when RFK's killer could become a free man. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Up next for us tonight, the Afghan-American pilot who's inspiring America. Finally, I'd like you to hear the story of inspiration from an American seeing himself in scenes of desperation in Afghanistan and decided to help. Here's Andrea Mitchell. They often arrive with just the clothes on their backs, weary from their hazardous journey. Families with frightened children starting over in a foreign land. Watching the news reawakened childhood memories for Zach Kogiani of feeling lost 
displaced as a refugee to the U.S. from Kabul. You were nine years old when you left as a refugee. Did all this bring it back to you? It all came rushing back, especially the scenes of the people hanging on to that C-17 as it was taxiing out. A pilot for United, he volunteered for flights from Ramstein to Dulles as a translator on the crew to reassure frightened passengers. I knew what was going through their minds. I knew what they had left behind. I knew what they had endured. A sense of relief overcame them that they knew this was actually really happening and they were flying to safety. You define yourself as a son of Afghanistan. What does that mean? We are dignified. We are proud. And you will never meet an Afghan who is willing to give up. What's your message to Americans about how welcoming they should be to all of these Afghans? Please be a good On this Friday night, the deepening danger of staying in Afghanistan. The threat of more attacks as the window is closing on getting people out. We will be the victims of uh, this uh, warfare and bloodshed. <laughs> How the U.S. is now forced to align with the Taliban to battle a common enemy. The patchwork of provincial vaccine passport plans. We really want to avoid that. The potential solution to avert complications and confusion. The dilemma of undecided voters. One party doesn't fit all of them. Their biggest concerns. And silver success. Canada's medal count grows at the Paralympics. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. On the outskirts of Kabul's airport, crowds of Afghans are not giving up. Even after yesterday's horrific attack, hundreds of people tried to find a way onto a flight, desperate to flee the Taliban. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. More evacuation flights are getting out of Kabul, but the clock is ticking because we are now just four days away from the U.S. withdrawal. And with Canada's rescue mission now over, thousands of vulnerable people who had hoped to come here are now stuck. Today, the federal government urged them not to give up hope. Let me be clear. We will not stop looking for other paths to bring these people home. We will continue to have discussions with our partners and explore avenues for them to return to Canada. We'll have more on Canada's response in a moment. But we begin in Kabul where people trapped under Taliban rule are now also grieving after yesterday's deadly attack. There are reports at least 170 people are dead. At least 200 others were wounded. Redmond Shannon has tonight's top story and a warning. Some of the images are distressing. Funerals for the victims of Thursday's deadly bombing. There are dozens more, including for children, killed simply trying to escape. Our hearts are on fire, says this man. When will the killings end? The people who died lived in fear of the Taliban, but were murdered instead by an affiliate of the so-called Islamic State, ISIS Khorasan. They're definitely trying to push an ideology, but they're also promoting an alternative Islamist state. So they're compromising the Taliban's uh, monopoly. Formed by radical Pakistani Taliban members seven years ago. Despite warnings that another attack could happen, some Afghans are still desperate to get to the airport. But Taliban roadblocks are everywhere and the flights are winding down. Spain and Australia, the latest countries to end their evacuations. Britain, not far behind. The main processing has now closed and we have a matter of hours. US flights will be the last to leave before the mission ends on Tuesday. More Afghans are now fleeing by land across the border to Pakistan. This man says he had been at Kabul airport for days but gave up and headed to the border instead. We are preparing for around 500,000 new refugees in the region. This is a worst case scenario. It's going to grow. You know, some of the other countries in the region uh you know, have indicated uh, that uh, they don't want to take uh, Afghan refugees. If commercial flights from Kabul soon return, they could allow those with visas to leave, pending permission from the Taliban, of course. When it comes to um, Afghans who, uh, who don't uh, have that documentation, uh, it's going to be much harder for them to leave. Western governments, including Canada's, say they're doing all they can to help those trying to leave. But come August 31st, the Taliban's control here will be absolute. Redmond Shannon, Global News. 
While the debate over whether the U.S. should withdraw continues, what isn't being debated is how poorly the withdrawal has been handled. The U.S. plans on removing all troops in the next four days, while many Afghans fear their country is on the brink of a new civil war. And as Jackson Prosco reports, they want help from the U.S., Canada and other allies. Under threat of imminent attack and a looming deadline for departure, the U.S.-led airlift continues. We have seen firsthand how dangerous that mission is, but ISIS will not deter us from accomplishing this mission. The death of more than a dozen American soldiers and dozens of Afghans at the hands of ISIS-K has not changed the fundamental goal. And then you come back. Getting as many people out before August 31st, no matter what. We will be the victims of uh, this uh, warfare and bloodshed. Shukla Zadran spoke with us from Kabul. She's staying for now, but fears being caught in a new war between ISIS-K and the ruling Taliban. I really, really hope that international community uh, should step in. And otherwise, uh, it will not only uh, it will not only challenge the security of Afghanistan, but it will challenge the security of the entire region and the entire uh, world. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. In response to Thursday's attack, President Biden has ordered the Pentagon to develop a list of potential ISIS-K targets, though the U.S. remains squarely focused on leaving, not future interventions. We will be able to fly out evacuees right up until the last moment. That's going to be the goal. The Pentagon will house up to 50,000 Afghan evacuees at U.S. military bases, while scaling back remaining troops over the next few days. What happens without an American presence remains a grave question for the people of Afghanistan. Even after we're gone, at whatever point, we need to use our leverage to try to induce uh, a more moderate form of Taliban rule going forward indefinitely. For now, there's an uneasy alliance between two former enemies who found common cause targeting ISIS-K. The U.S. has made it clear it does not trust the Taliban. Amidst this hasty and devastating exit, Americans have no choice but to. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau defended his government's response in Afghanistan. The issue continues to dog the liberal leader on the campaign trail. He says Canada's working day and night to get Afghans to safety, but he offered little information as to how. Abigail Beeman reports. We need to, we need to keep each other safe. Hoping to focus on vaccines, the Liberals made an announcement at a restaurant owned by Syrian refugees. But again, attention wrapped on the thousands of Afghan refugees hoping to have a similar Canadian success story. We did everything we could, uh, but uh, of course it got uh, even more intense, more quickly than everyone expected. Blaming the rapid and deadly Taliban takeover, Trudeau stressed Canada is working around the clock to find ways to get people out, committed to resettling 20,000 Afghans. It is the largest airlift in history. A flank of ministers tried to reassure Canadians bureaucracy is not moving at the snail's pace being reported by those in Afghanistan so desperate to get to safety. Yesterday, our output was increased over 250% with average wait times being only two and a half minutes. The government says it's working with nearby countries waiving some fees and has a special envoy to Afghanistan who's on the ground in Qatar. If you're not there, you can't play. Former diplomat Colin Robertson believes Canada needs to get back into Afghanistan to help get people out. Move in as quickly as possible. And again, I underline that diplomatic recognition is not a, a seal of approval of that government. It's simply how we do business. The government says regional partners are talking with the Taliban, trying to convince them to keep the airport open. The argument is being presented that it's in the advantage of the country to have a, an open airport because it's a landlocked country. But the August 31st deadline is just days away and the Canadian government won't get into specifics about what's happening on the ground, even on the question of whether they'll beef up diplomatic staff in nearby regions. We asked and Trudeau wouldn't answer. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Nobleton, Ontario. The opposition has also been highly critical of the federal government's response in Afghanistan. And today, conservative leader Aaron O'Toole finally laid out his party's plan for dealing with the crisis. But experts warn there are no easy answers. Michael Couture is traveling with the conservative campaign. Mike. 
Well, Farah, for days, Aaron O'Toole refused to say exactly what he'd do differently compared to Justin Trudeau to help people trying to flee Afghanistan. Then, Thursday evening, he released a studio-produced video with a three-part plan. Rededicate ourselves to work with our allies and Afghanistan's neighbors. In addition to that, O'Toole said he would work with neighboring countries like India to create safe humanitarian and refugee corridors. Also, the conservative leader says he'd provide political and material support to Afghans resisting the Taliban. At a press conference Friday, he said support would include intelligence sharing and satellite imaging. But it was unclear if, as prime minister, O'Toole would help arm those who oppose the Taliban. Yes or no, would you give them weapons to fight the Taliban? That's giving material and political support that is not meant to be offensive. It's meant to protect. It's meant to provide assistance, intelligence, to help isolate and keep the Taliban away from areas where they could harm people. O'Toole added that providing flak jackets could also help keep people safe on the ground. As for providing safe routes out of the country, defense analysts say that could be difficult given the current geopolitical situation of the region. You're going to need to basically make it safe for these people to leave um, very unsafe Afghanistan to not just go into a worse situation or also unsafe situation somewhere else. The bottom line is like that, that all is much more difficult uh, than trying to bring people from outside an airport to get inside the airport and then get on a Canadian plane. And that option's totally gone. David Perry, like most everyone else looking at this crisis, wishes more could have been done a month ago. Farah? Michael Couture. Thank you, Mike. Turning now to the pandemic, children aged 12 and up will now be able to get the Moderna vaccine. Health Canada says it is safe and effective at preventing COVID-19 infection in older kids. Until today, Moderna was only available to adults. This is the second COVID-19 vaccine to be authorized for kids over the age of 12. Pfizer received the stamp of approval in May, and there is still no approved COVID-19 vaccine for younger children, but clinical trials are underway. Manitoba is bringing back its mask mandate. Starting tomorrow, face coverings will once again be required in all indoor public spaces. The province is also bringing in new immunization measures. Starting in September, anyone wanting to go to a sporting event, a restaurant or a gym will need to be fully vaccinated. And as Jamie Morocker explains, the Liberals hope new funding will push other provinces to follow suit with vaccine passports. A vaccine mandate for non-essential businesses is a good idea. And one the Liberal leader says his government is willing to fund, offering to cover the cost for any province implementing a vaccine passport. So far, that just includes British Columbia, Quebec and Manitoba. These mandates to say that you have to prove vaccination status in order to do the activities which we're used to can be a very helpful nudge. In BC alone, the day after its announcement, COVID-19 vaccination bookings rose 124 percent. Reaching all eligible Canadians remains a challenge. Now you're asking for public health information. And to me, you know, that opens a can of worms that I'm not willing in any way to entertain. I can't believe that there wasn't sort of a universal thing all over Canada to do it. In Alberta, Jason Kenney has repeatedly refused the idea of a vaccine passport. Meantime, sources in Ontario tell Global News Doug Ford's government is considering a proof of vaccination proposal after months of stopping short. We really want to avoid that patchwork. It can be, it could be an undue, cause an undue burden on small businesses and on uh, individuals uh, after already a very trying 17 months. Ottawa has only committed to a vaccine passport for international travel. Now the federal government doesn't have the vaccination status of all Canadians. That's a provincial health care responsibility. A decision that, if left up to each individual premier, could create more confusion than cohesion. Jamie Morocker, Global News, Toronto. While Liberal leader Justin Trudeau pushed provinces to mandate vaccines during his campaign stop this morning, he dodged questions about his own event that appeared to break COVID-19 capacity rules in Ontario. There are definitely more than 25 people in this fairly tight and crowded space. Are you breaking the spirit, if not the letter of the law? I think Canadians are facing a really important choice right now. We're going to continue to remind Canadians that the big decisions about our future, they're being made now. 
I'm not sure that was an answer to my question. So did you get special clearance to hold an event that exceeds current crowd capacity in Ontario indoors? Uh, we're going to continue to do everything we can uh, to uh, keep people safe. We expect all of our candidates to be vaccinated. Trudeau, like other leaders, are crisscrossing the country, vying for your vote. Coming up, what the polls are suggesting about who could win on election night. The federal election campaign has been underway for less than two weeks, but polls show the race is tightening. The Liberals' quest for a majority government may turn into a battle to hold on to power. New polling done exclusively for Global News looks at public perception of Canada's potential prime ministers. Eric Sorensen reports. Oh, yes, 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 I, I Justin Trudeau's campaign kicked off, riding a wave of approval that had held steady throughout the pandemic. But questions around an early election call and the crisis in Afghanistan have forced the Liberal leader's focus from campaign promises to crisis management. This is a very difficult day, not just for Afghans, uh, but for people around the world, including in Canada. The opposition able to keep alive the question, why an election now? Mr. Trudeau has provided no reason for the election and no plan. I don't think Canadians can afford another four years of Justin Trudeau. Ipsos found Trudeau's favorable ratings are now exceeded by unfavorable. His net rating stands at minus 12. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's net favorability is lower at minus 21. But NDP leader Jagmeet Singh at plus six is the only leader with a net positive rating. Jagmeet Singh has absolutely become an asset for the NDP uh, ticket. And uh, he uh, is clearly somebody, particularly I would say progressive voters, are prepared to, to, to take a look at. And while Aaron O'Toole's ratings remain low, he's also the least well-known. And polls show the Conservatives gaining ground. Canadians deserve better. Sensing Liberal vulnerability, O'Toole and Singh are both targeting the Greater Toronto Area, where elections can be decided. It was in the GTA in the 2015 election that the Liberals built an electoral bastion. Even reduced to a minority in 2019, the Red Fortress held. But when things start to turn, it can look like 2008. The Stephen Harper Conservatives won seats in the so-called 905 belt and the NDP downtown. By 2011, the Liberals' nightmare. The Conservatives and NDP attacked from the right and the left and took over much of Toronto from north to south. And we are going to keep fighting. The favorable response to Singh is partly his appeal to young voters on platforms like TikTok. With the knots in the rows. But O'Toole is better positioned. The Conservatives already within striking distance of the Liberals. A five-week campaign leaves the challengers little time to overtake an incumbent prime minister. But if the race really begins to swing the other way, Justin Trudeau will also have less time to right the ship. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. From the Olympics to the Paralympics, ahead the inspiring Canadian comeback in Tokyo. And with that, another medal added to Canada's hall in Tokyo at the Paralympics. Canada's flag bearer Priscilla Gagné grappling her way to second place in the women's 52 kilogram category in judo. It's her first Paralympic medal. And track cyclist Kate O'Brien made an impressive and inspiring debut at the Paralympics. She didn't end up getting the gold. The 33-year-old Calgarian finished second in women's C4 500-meter time trial. It caps off a remarkable comeback story. O'Brien competed for Team Canada in Rio in 2016. A bike crash in 2017 left her in a coma with a major brain injury. Doctors initially weren't sure she'd survive or even walk again. Through intense rehabilitation, she's been able to return to competitive cycling. Up next, I speak with some of Canada's undecided voters. What will it take for a federal party to win them over? Ahead of September 20th, Election Day, Global National is traveling across the country to talk to you, the viewers, the voters. We want to know what matters to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. While in Vancouver recently, I spoke to people who consider themselves undecided voters. I asked them about what matters most this election and what might push them to make a decision. 
tell me a bit about yourself. I'm 69, I'm a senior, I'm retired from the Vancouver School Board as an educator, and I would love to see more affordable housing for my children and grandchildren. Would you say affordability and housing is your number one issue this election? Housing and ethics and government is my are my two main issues. Ethics and government, tell me a bit more about that. Well, I think our current federal government has been uh, not transparent with us, and so I'm really undecided as to who to vote for to actually get rid of this government. Is there anything that the Liberals could do to get back your trust and your vote? The way they've treated uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould, the way they've treated Indigenous people, it's just been really awful to watch. The only way to win back my trust for the Liberals is to get rid of uh, trust fund Justin Trudeau. So for you, it's really about him. It's about voting him out. I'm leaning either NDP or Conservative. Whichever one has the best chance of getting rid of Justin Trudeau. My name is Jimmy. Um, I'm 28 years old. I'm a fashion designer and a graphic designer. And that's why you're dressed so well. So Jimmy, tell me about your number one issue this election. Definitely climate change. I feel like that's the larger issue because a lot of the wildfires or even like drought, like lack of food, all that comes back to like how we treat the earth and manage our resources. And so what do you need to hear from political leaders right now on that file on climate to get your vote? Just keep what you're saying because that's what I'm voting on and that's what I trusted you when I put the ballot in. Are you leaning one way or the other or are you going to vote strategically? One party doesn't fit all of them. You know, they all have different things that they value.